I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. Today, we're taking a journey into the world of culture and politics, where, believe it or not, there are signs that mankind's perpetual war against the devil, the flesh, and the world is taking a turn for the better in 2023 and into 2024. The harsh reality, of course, is that there is only so much that we can accomplish with no pope and no recognizable church hierarchy. But nevertheless, a new breed of outspoken leaders and a new generation of conservatives, guided by the natural law and at least some generic Christian core values, are seeing modernism and its political spawn, liberalism, for what it is, and starting to take action to defeat it. We're pretty much all familiar with the words of Pope St. Pius X, or words he likely said, when he said that modernists should be beaten with fists. Today, we're wanting to take a deeper dive into what we believe Pope St. Pius X meant with this phrase. And while we're not really seeing any victories in Holy Mother of the Church these days, eh, aside from perhaps a Pachamama being tossed into the Tiber River, we as political conservatives are starting to win, and win big in the socio-political, cultural realm. And it's something that you don't hear very often from conservatives, I think, at least traditional Catholic conservatives. It's, it's much more of the black pill out there. And anyone who watches the show knows that that's not really what we think here. We think that it's better to take a little bit of a more optimistic approach. Now, not everyone agrees with that, but that's how we feel. So let's start with what Pope St. Pius X didn't mean when he used the expression beaten with fists. He quite obviously didn't mean it as a call for lay Catholics to go to a family get-together and start fistfights with their non-Catholic family members. It was never intended as a call to literal physical violence course not. But it was a grave admonition nonetheless, modernism being, as again Pope St. Pius X defined it, the synthesis of all heresies. That's bad. It is an existential threat, not only against the core of church teaching, but against the natural law itself. It's doctrine that comes straight from the pit of hell. Its committed adherents are not simply misguided heretics who are challenging a point or two of Catholic dogma, but they are rather enemies of mankind whose goal is the enslavement and ultimate destruction of all that is good and decent, and the creation of a dystopia in which a small ruling elite controls every aspect of the rest of humanity and abolishes all semblance of Catholic doctrine, sacraments, and culture. It is not a philosophy that can be negotiated with, which is why Pope St. Pius X used such strong language. Quote, they, speaking of the modernists, or those who negotiate with modernists, I should say, want them to be treated with oil, soap, and caresses. But they should be beaten with fists. Again, you know, even if this quote, which is attributed to Pope St. Pius X, and I, I know some people don't like it and don't say that he didn't actually say that, I think that his attitude towards modernists throughout his entire reign as Pope show that he at least believed this in many ways. Maybe not, you know, I guess literally with fists, I suppose, but the idea of it. He knew that you could not sit around and, and, and you know, go to a table with them and, and, you know, what's the word they always say? Um, discuss with, with the modernists. No, you had to fight them, you know, with, with everything you had. The purpose of today's video then is to give someone of a quote unquote roadmap for beating modernists with fists, so to speak. But perhaps more importantly, to show that a new generation of leaders worldwide is understanding the nature of the modernist liberal threat and taking action. And in many cases, that action is not only satisfying to watch, but also quite funny. Fair warning, because of the subject matter in this video, there is some salty language along the way. This is probably not a good video for young children. So if they're there with you, maybe, you know, I don't know, save it for later push them out of the room, whatever you feel like. Nothing too obscene, of course, but enough that young children should not be be hearing even the context. Al zurdo de mierda no le podés dar ni un milímetro. ¿Pero me podés definir zurdo de mierda? Todos los que, digamos, los colectivistas, (risa) los que ponen, digamos, o sea, esa idea... ¿Por qué le pones de mierda, digamos? Porque son una mierda. O sea, pero si, clas- no, pero, ese, pero es que si pensás de, pero no, pero pero si pensá distinto te van, a, te van a aniquilar. Ese es el punto. Es decir, vos al zurdo no le podés dar un milímetro, porque le das un milímetro y lo toma para destrozarte. Es decir, usa, digo, o sea, vos no podés negociar con el zurdo. No se negocia. 
No se negocia con esa mierda, no se negocia porque te van a llevar puesta. No les importa arruinarte la vida. ¿Por qué? Porque no pensás como ellos. ¿Y sabes qué es lo bueno de todo esto? Hay algo bueno en todo esto. Porque como el error es humano, como todos nos podemos equivocar, ¿sabes qué nos obliga? Nos obligan a ser mejores. Y como estamos siendo tan mejores con ellos, como los estamos aplastando en la batalla cultural, los estamos pasando de arriba, porque no solo le ganamos en lo productivo, somos superiores moralmente, somos superiores estéticamente, somos mejores en todo. Y les duele, les duele. Entonces, como no pueden pelear con las herramientas legítimas, se, ap se apalancan en el aparato represivo del Estado, poniendo torres de guita para hacernos miedo. Y aún así no pueden. Internet. And as for the definition of woke, woke has one purpose, only one purpose. Plenty of pretexts, but only one purpose: control. It is designed to divide people by race, by gender, by ethnicity, by religion, by vaccine status, and any other way that they can divide people into groups. Because why? Then you can justify having a government to control all those groups. No more woke. We need. What's up guys, it's your boy Benny. There's a principle in filmmaking of frame control where you control what the person is seeing, how the camera moves and what's being captured. You can't capture everything. You're trying to project a message, send a specific vision for the world. Frame control also applies to politics where you don't have to answer the reporter's question. You're not a slave. They don't have power over you. You can challenge a question and kick it right back into their faces, which is exactly the tactic that the Vakron Swami is using right now. And it's so incredibly smart in how he is doing interviews. Every single time that Vakron Swami is on the stage with a corporate media reporter, he is viewing them as the enemy, as a opponent, as someone to challenge. And it's creating an incredible series of wins for Vivek. Like for instance, in this CNN clip, Vivek is asked about Donald Trump and Donald Trump using colorful language. And he's like, what the hell are we talking about this for? You're the problem. You're not covering real issues in America. That's called frame control. He doesn't need to answer the question, which is a trap, which is a signal boost for a specific agenda. You can actually control the entire conversation because you're a free man. You don't have to dance to their tune. It's beautiful. Check this out. This is going thermonuclear right now. Uh, it's Vivek on CNN. That language, they live like vermin. Do you believe that that is, as your uh, Republican colleague, Chris Christie has said, neo-Nazi rhetoric? This is a classic mainstream media move. Pick some individual phrase of Donald Trump, focus on literally that word without actually interrogating the substance of what's at issue. The word I was chosen for a reason. We are in the middle reason. of a cultural war in this country. The well, word you know was what? It, it, it's reason. actually describing a series of behaviors. You have Antifa and other related groups that have been burning down cities for the last three years in this country. Would you describe them Wildly as vermin? violating the rule of law. We have an invasion on our southern border. We have millions of people crossing our southern border. Let's talk about the substance okay. of why we have to recognize would, that we're not in ordinary you, times. Would you so use that language The vocabulary language of the vermin or not is not what's important. Well, I haven't used that language. So, so you can look you? at my, my track record on the campaign trail. I talk about the issues. We all talk about them differently. But what I'm not going to do is play some game of focusing on some word that somebody else said without ignoring entirely the substance of what we're actually talking about. A border crisis of historic proportion. Economic stagnation we haven't seen in 50 years. A national identity crisis and a loss of national pride in the next generation that's potentially existential for this country. Let's talk about our dependence on China. Today we're actually talking about Xi Jinping, picking on Donald Trump's word vermin to talk about that status quo. You know what's vermin? What's running around San Francisco on a given day before Gavin Newsom cleaned it up on a dime to roll out the red carpet for Xi Jinping? If he could do that for Xi Jinping, he could have done it on an ordinary day. And yet we're here sitting talking not about the substance of that, but on one word that Donald Trump said in some speech in Miami. This is what's wrong with the mainstream media. Focus on the substance and let's have an actual policy debate rather than talking to a presidential candidate instead of the policy substance of what's actually going on in the country. Picking on some word that Donald Trump said on a certain day and asking me for comment on it. Give me a break. Questo. Questo è un bambino che lavora in una miniera d'oro in Burkina Faso. Il Burkina Faso è una delle nazioni più povere del mondo. 
Per il Burkina Faso che ha l'oro, la Francia stampa moneta coloniale. In cambio pretende che finiscano nelle casse del tesoro francese il 50% di tutto quello che il Burkina Faso esporta. L'oro che questo bambino si infila in un cunicolo per tirare fuori finisce per lo più nelle casse dello Stato francese. Allora la soluzione non è prendere gli africani e spostarli in Europa, la soluzione è liberare l'Africa da certi europei che la sfruttano e consentire a queste persone di vivere di quello che hanno. And frankly, look, the people there are cheering for losing in the Republican Party. Think about who's moderating this debate. This should be Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, and Elon Musk. We'd have 10 times the viewership asking questions that GOP primary voters actually care about and bringing more people into our party. Do you think the Democrats, and we've got Christian Welfare here, do you think the Democrats would actually hire Greg Gutfeld to host a Democratic debate? They wouldn't do it. And so the fact of the matter is, I mean, Chris, I'm going to use this time because this is actually about you in the media and the corrupt media establishment. Ask you the Trump-Russia collusion hoax that you pushed on this network for years. Was that real or was that Hillary Clinton made up disinformation? Answer the question. Go. Mr. Robert. This is how we get our country back. We need accountability because this media rigged the 2016 election. They rigged the 2020 election with the Hunter Biden laptop story. Mr. Ramos, and they're going to rig this election. Your time is up. Accountability. Let me turn That's to Governor, Governor Christie. Why? Thank, you. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Marcos, can I just start with you? You testified a moment ago to Senator Butler that every child gets a Know Your Rights presentation. Is that correct? That is correct. Is that before or after you release them to labor traffickers? Senator, every child that comes into our care gets a Know Your Rights presentation as well as... Have you read these New York Times reports, these stories, the, the series of stories the New York Times has done on the children who are in your care? Have you read them? Yes, I have. Have you read that children are scrubbing dishes... They are operating heavy machinery. They are delivering, delivering meals. They are harvesting coffee. They are working construction. They are working as housekeepers. They are working overnight shifts at plants where they are not paid. They are not going to school. They are not cared for. They are not giving meals, almost all of it illegally. Are you aware of that? That's a yes or no. Yes. Do the Know Your Rights presentation help them in those situations? Senator ORR. Uh, That's a yes or no, I think. I, Do you really think that you're helping these children by releasing them to labor traffickers and, yes, sex traffickers, 85,000 children whom you have no contact with? And your answer is we gave them a presentation before we turned them over to these people who are exploiting them on a scale not seen in this country for a hundred years, a century. A century. It's a disgrace. Hello. What do you have to say to the trans students on this campus who actively feel victimized by your presence here today? Life's tough. Get a helmet, man. I'm too pregnant for this. Next question. Okay. Um, on, the, on the topic, I mean, in terms of your sort of strategy currently, you're obviously taking the populist uh, pathway. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> well, ap appealing appealing to people's uh, more emotional levels, I would guess. Um, I mean, what certainly, you mean certainly, you, certainly, you tap, certainly you tap certainly you tap very strong ideological language quite frequently. Like what? Uh, left wing, you know, this and that. Right wing, you know. I mean, it's that that type I of ideological thing. I never really talk about left but or right. But anyways, a lot I of people. I don't really believe in that. Okay, a lot of people would would say that you're simply taking a page out of the. Donald Trump uh, well, book. Like which people would say that? Well, I'm sure a great many Canadians, but... Like who? <laughs> I don't know who, but... Well, you're um, the one who asked the question, so yeah. I, you must know somebody. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sure there's some out there, but anyways, the, the, point of this, the point of this question is, I mean, why should, why should Canadians trust you with their vote, given, you know... Not not just the sort of ideological inclination in terms of taking the page of Donald Trump's book, but also... What are you also, talking about? What page? What page? Can you give okay. me a page? Give me the page. You keep <laughs> in, saying in terms, that. In terms of tur turning things quite dramatically in terms of, of Trudeau and, and the left wing and all of this, I mean, you, you, you make quite a, you know, it's, it's quite a play that you make on it. 
So I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, under, I, don't, I don't know what your question okay. is. Okay, then forget that. Why should Canadians yep. trust you with their vote? Common sense. Okay. Common sense for, for a change. Well, they took my mugshot. It's a big, beautiful mugshot. Look at it. I call it the Mona Lisa of mugshots. It's incredible. Look at that. It's like my phone calls. It's a perfect mugshot. So perfect and so beautiful. You know, many people say that they have a good side and a bad side. I only have one side. It's called my great side. They got my great side with this mugshot. It's a beautiful picture of a very handsome guy with wonderful hair. Such a beautiful mugshot that... Hunter Biden may want to paint a picture of it and sell it for a lot of money to Russia, 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 or China, or even Ukraine. You know about it. Such a perfect, beautiful, highly respected mugshot. The greatest mugshot in the history of the world, believe me. There's a light. A certain kind of light. Russell Wilson has had a rough couple weeks, right? Like, there's been a lot said about him. And I'm not, I'm just saying, he, he, he didn't play last week. He comes to London, and he finds a way to help his team get a win. Whatever we could say about him Dude. in the past, right? Like, big yeah. time, big time today. Absolutely. Look, I, you know what? I'm going I'm to I'm piggyback off of it. Look, I don't care about all the personal stuff. Correct. I'm not. I don't care about what you feel about him, his family. I don't care about any of that because that's not what we do here. We're just analyzing the football player. And this guy in the second half said, you know what? I'm going to start firing this football. Yep. I'm going to get it out of my hands. I'm yep. going to get it to, I'm going to get it to, you know, KJ Hamler. And Latavius Murray's going to take over. And you know what? He, he said, too. What, what did he say? I mean, as you see him down here on the field leading the prayer, he said, look, I kind of welcome all this. I, he hears it. He hears what people are saying. He hears people taking shots at him. You want evidence of a worldwide revival happening right now? Check out what happened at a Walmart randomly in Kansas. Catholic, and I also pitch for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Trevor Williams. Now with at least six innings or more without allowing a run. Pretty phenomenal. I feel like I've been around baseball my entire life. In San Diego, there's such a hotbed of talent, so I was really surrounded by a lot of good baseball players growing up. But when I got into college, I started delving deeper into apologetics. Why is you know the Catholic Church the absolute truth? How is that going to shape me moving forward? I know baseball is not the most important thing in the world. I take my job very serious. I do have bad days where it feel really down because I let my team down and I let myself down. But um, at the end of the day, I know the sun comes up tomorrow morning. As I do these things, I help, you know, build the kingdom of God.
My faith to me is more than just going to Mass on Sundays. The prayer that I pray every time before I go pitch, I have a, a St. Benedict crucifix on my locker, and I say, Jesus, I trust in you. You know, sometimes you need to get your butt kicked a little bit to, to really humble you and bring you back down. When I think about Jesus, the, the first word that comes to mind is hope. He's my hope. And this world, man, it can get crazy sometimes. Within the revered baseball sanctuary of Dodger Stadium, a rare post-game Sunday cathedral emerges with a different pitch delivered by a future Hall of Famer. What anchors you? What gives you hope past this world? For us, that's Jesus. Jesus is our eternal hope. Clayton Kershaw, Dodger teammates, and manager Dave Roberts returned the Dodgers Faith and Family event to engage devoted participants after a four-year absence. We've had it here for a long time. Once COVID hit, we kind of forgot about it. And with everything that's gone on this year, as a team, it just kind of felt like the best way to show what I stand for and what some of our teammates stand for is we believe in Jesus and we get to talk about it. And we've got a cool platform to be able to bring fans out and hear it. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, and we don't know if we're going to win the culture war in the coming years, but we know that in the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph, and that even in these days of darkness, there are still rays of light all around us. Let us be a ray of light and shine it to the world, especially during this Christmas season. This is Kevin Davis. Thank you for watching.